Alrighty. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> Can people hear me roughly at the back? Is the mic working-ish? Yay! Okay. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming along on this kind of beautiful-ish day um, to hear about presentations. So uh, I'm just curious. Well, actually, no. I know who's out there. I know who. I see you people. Some of you are third year, some of you are masters, and some of you are PhD students. So thanks, everyone, for coming. PhD students, apologies for the late notice. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk just briefly about how to make and give presentations and show you some tricks and tips to make good presentations, tell you a bit about how your third year dissertation presentations go, just in terms of the mechanics of it. It's, it's probably all old news to all of you, but I figured I'd go through it anyway. Uh, but just as background, you know, in some sense, all of your life is about making presentations. So whether it's kind of a formal presentation like you're going to have to do in the next couple weeks or whether it's informal, just kind of meeting a potential new employer, new boss, new supervisor, whatever it is, uh, there's lots of times where you have to present yourself. Um, and given the fact that you were, many of you, almost all of you, were undergrads here at Bangor, you already have an incredible leg up. Bangor has done a great job. I've always heard from my colleagues in other schools that, oh, your psychology students are just so good at giving presentations. They're so articulate, they're so confident, blah, blah, blah. So rest assured, all of your stupid pops training that you had to go through at the beginning is actually was, was and will continue to be incredibly valuable and will help you make your presentation. So that's good. Today isn't really so much about just generally how to make presentations. It's kind of more specific, targeted, and tactical. It's really about the nuts and bolts gentle reminders, how to do things. I'm going to actually go through PowerPoint, how to make quick presentations in PowerPoint, things like that. My little disclaimer, this is just James's view, so it's not the official School of Psychology policy. If you follow everything I say here, I don't guarantee you'll get an A star on your presentation, but it probably won't bring you too far afield. Uh, so uh, first, are there any questions, any particular issues that I should try to go over, or should I just, eh, I'll, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions at any point. All right, so all of this is leading up to your third year presentations or your summer presentations if you're a PhD student or your master's dissertation presentations if you're a master's student. Um, and in all of those cases, the oral presentations are kind of worth a lot. So for you doing your third years, which I think is most of you, for your dissertation presentations, uh, it's worth, I don't even know, dozens and dozens of credits. Now, it's a small percent, so it's like 10 or 15%, but it's 10 or 15% of a giant module. So ultimately, if you work out the numbers, it is that one 10-minute presentation is basically worth like what a second-year midterm exam or second-year final exam was worth. So it's worth a lot. Not to put the pressure on, but it is worth a lot. So you want to do it, you want to do a good job on it. Uh, for lots of staff, you know, it, it is something we have to go do, but at the same time, it's one of our few joys. It means it's the end of the academic year, and it means we get to kind of hear what all of our colleagues are up to. So it's like the only way I ever hear what Christoph Klein or Guillaume Piri or any of these people are actually doing is when I go to the third year of the master's presentations. That's the only time I ever get to talk to my colleagues about what they're up to. So it's kind of cool. Most of us actually really look forward to it, um, and we're not too tough. You, there's a couple of us who are kind of tough and might ask hard questions, but in general, we're there to help you um, make a good presentation, and we, we hope you do make good presentations. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. So today, I'm going to go through a bunch of different things. I'm going to talk about how you should go about planning a presentation. And again, most of this, in fact, from here on out, pretty much everything is universally relevant, whether you're a third year master's or PhD student. You should start by planning a presentation, prepare it. I'm going to go through how to make slides, what kind of details you should and shouldn't include on slides, things like that, how you should present stuff. I'm going to go through some psychology-specific bits, because psychology is a weird kind of area where you present studies, methods, and all that. So I'll go through some of that. I might at the end talk about posters, but I probably won't. Out of curiosity, raise your hand if any of you are planning on doing a poster of any kind in the next four months. Yeah. We used to have an option for some third years could do posters. Same with PhD students, masters, but anyway, we don't do that anymore. So I won't say it. At the end, if anyone's curious, you could ask and I might say some words about posters. Oh yeah, so as we go along, not that it matters too much, I'm going to kind of lead a little running trail of where we are. So the first thing to think about is to plan your presentation. You should start early, so you should be starting kind of now. Um, I am, by the way, recording this, and I'm also going to put the slides up on Blackboard or someplace, so uh, feel free. I'll make the video available, and I'll make the slides available, so you don't have to take too many notes. So yeah, uh, you should really know who your audience is, and in, in the case, again, for most of you, the third year thing, this is what you probably need to know, that you'll have one academic in the room, so it'll be someone like a me, like a me, uh, you'll have a PhD student, someone like a one of them, sorry, you'll have a, an academic and a PhD student, and they are there as kind of the judges, if you will, uh, they'll give you a grade at the end. After everyone has done their presentations and everyone leaves the room, 
the academic and the PhD student will sit and arm wrestle and decide, well, was it a B or a B plus? Was it an A or an A star? And, you know, well, was that one better than this one? How did that one do? You know, blah, blah, blah. So we go through and make that decision. Um, so in terms of who's there, it's yes, it's an academic and it's a PhD student. Also, the PhD student, by the way, is there kind of as the MC and host. They'll tell some jokes, they'll warm up the room, they'll ask for applause. No, they won't do any of that stuff. But they are there sort of as a host. So they, they, will, they should ask you in advance, so yeah, what's your name? Okay, and who did you work with? And then when it's time to do it, they'll say, okay, next up we have Jim and Trilligator. He worked with John Polich, and he's going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's what the PhD student is there for, and to give a second opinion about the grades. All right, so those are the two main players. And then, of course, you'll have a bunch of other third years in the room. And you're free to invite your friends if you want to invite your parents or your pet poodle, anyone you want. You can bring anyone along you want. Uh, realistically, there's probably about six people in the room. Uh, I, it is not unusual, though, to bring a few friends. If you feel more comfortable, you're welcome to bring friends along as well. They could sit in the room. You Every year, there's... Usually one or two students there will have brought along one or two friends, and it's kind of nice, actually. I like it as the academic in the room to actually feel that there's an audience and it's not just kind of an inquisition or something. So yeah, feel free to invite friends, as long as they aren't too rowdy at the back. Um, so and the other thing to keep in mind is that, yes, it'll be a bunch of other third-year students, so it'll be like, well, let's say four of you, five of you, maybe six of you, and you'll present one after the next. Uh, the magic powers that be, they've, they've allocated students so that there shouldn't be in your session anyone else from your project group. I'm pretty sure that's the case. So like if you're presenting a project that you did with uh, Marie-Joseph, let's say, um, and you want to explain the project, blah, 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 you shouldn't have anyone else later or before you who's done the same project. So you can kind of bend the rules a little bit. Uh, and you, well, anyway, yeah, so there shouldn't be anyone else from the same project group. Uh, and how will it work? Yes, yeah, so there'll be an intro, which will usually be the kind of the PhD student saying just usually just your name. Uh, and then it's your turn and you get about 10 minutes to, to kind of present your, your, uh, your research. And then there'll be questions. Questions usually initially from the audience, any of the other students who are there, or the PhD student, or the staff member, the academic who's there as well. And they'll just ask questions. And remember, if you're there as a third year student, you should also be a good audience. You should try to pay attention. If you have a question that you want to ask, um, that's always a lovely thing. We, as academics, sometimes have trouble thinking of all the good questions. So feel free to jump in and ask a question if you really have one. Don't just ask it for the sake of asking it, but um, come along and be entertained as well. So that's kind of the overall format of the day. Um, so that's kind of your consumers and audience, the format and the constraints. That's pretty much everything that you need to know. In I put this slide here because I make this presentation in other contexts as well. So if you were making a business presentation, it might be kind of different. And of course, if it were you know the buyer for a big project, then it's a different kind of thing. So anyway, for future issues, you should always think about who your consumers are, who's going to be in the audience, what will they know. So in this case, it's going to be academics and your colleagues, other third-year students who know your stuff, know science pretty well. So you don't have to explain a lot of the background, but beware sometimes there are people in the audience who don't know your stuff. So. Uh, your goal, yes. So your goal, believe it or not, it partly is to just entertain. You know, you don't want to give a boring talk. You don't want people to fall asleep in your talk. So you want to entertain a little bit. You want to show that you have some expertise. You want to show that you have some enthusiasm and some kind of passion for this topic area. So try to be excited. It's always kind of a bummer if the students are like, well, and then we did this, and I don't know why, but we kind of did this. And You know, try to seem enthusiastic at least. Um, pretend it's the core essence of your life. Uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say about that. Any questions about that? The overall mechanics of it all? I have a little bit more later about that, but... All right, so next is planning your presentation. So PowerPoint, I think most people will probably use PowerPoint. You may want to do Prezi. Feel free to do Prezi. Um, it's always interesting to see a Prezi, but overall, overall, I would recommend avoiding Prezi, but actually I shouldn't say that. I love Prezi. Prezi's awesome, but if you're going to use Prezi, you should use Prezi well. You shouldn't just use Prezi as another form of PowerPoint. It shouldn't just be slide and then zoom out, slide, zoom out, slide. Uh, if you're going to use Prezi, you should be, oh, raise your hand if you know what Prezi is. I assume everyone kind of does, yeah. Uh, so if you want to use Prezi, try to use it well. You want to zoom in to slides. You want to zoom out if it's a different topic area, etc. So feel free to use Prezi. It's a it's a lovely thing if it's done well. If it's just done as PowerPoint, then it's kind of like, well, why distract us with all this preziness if it's not really being used as a preziness? <laughs> uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create a PowerPoint. We're going to go through it, and I want to cover these various topics. Do -do -do -do. How to use outlines, how to use templates, how to use master slides, how to use transitions, how to use animations, how to use two screens, and how to print 
your files, the printing doesn't really matter. But that's the plan. I'm going to jump out of this presentation, boom, and make a whole new presentation, new. So this is where it's going to kind of fall apart, and I'm going to kind of make it up as I go along. But <laughs> let's say this was your presentation, and it's kind of the night before, and you're getting ready to, well, no, it should be a week before, and you're getting ready for your thing tomorrow. So here it is, PowerPoint staring at you, not much to do. There's a lot of different views you can take in PowerPoint, okay? So down here at the bottom, it shows you different options, right? So now I'm in normal view, I can go to slide sort of view, and then it kind of shows all the little slides, or you can go to slideshow, and it starts the slideshow. So that's one thing to know. If you're in normal view, this little guy here, then everything is lovely, it shows you the slide right here, it lets you put notes down here. Hi, everyone. And little notes down there, see, a little note. Uh, and it has over here a little thumbnail of the slides. So all that's pretty straightforward. But one thing you may not know about are these outlines. And that's what I wanted to show you is outline. Now, outline is pretty awesome. It's really, it makes it very easy to do a lot of damage quickly. So I'm going to go into outline mode, outline, boom. So now over here, I now have an outline mode. And so I'm going to make, I'm going to make a PowerPoint presentation. Let's call it, since I do consumer psychology, we'll do kind of consumer psychology, uh, Bangor University. So consumer psychology uh, of Bangor University students, something like that. Uh, and then I hit a return, boom. And in outline mode, whenever I have a return, essentially, it gives me a new slide. So this is the first slide. So I'll have here uh, background and introduction. I hit return. So now it's gone to a new slide. This will be the third slide. But I actually want to continue on that same slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit a tab. If I hit tab, it means I want to indent. But in this outline mode, tab means you actually want it to be on that same slide. So now I'm going to say, you know, where is Banger? That's the first question. Why would anyone want to go, anyone <laughs> ever go to Banger? Um, life at Banger rules, something like that. Okay, I hit a return. Now it thinks I'm about to put another line in my little list. And in fact, if I started typing, you'll see that it, oh, it's appearing as another line, but I don't want that. This time I want to make a new slide. So if I hold shift tab, it means you want to go back to kind of this outline making slides mode. So the first thing I said is banger. So I'm going to say, where is banger? And I'll make the next slide is going to be, uh, um, why go to banger? And then life at Bangor, and then conclusions. Yay! So pretty quickly, and I'll hit a return after conclusions and a tab. So it's a bullet point here. Bangor is awesome, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Party line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Party line, <laughs> etc. All right. So uh, pretty quickly, within two minutes, I was able to make the outline of my presentation. So of course, for you, it would probably be more like methods, introduction. You probably still have background. Maybe I should have made a sciencey one instead of a consumer one, but it doesn't really matter. You get the idea. So it's a pretty easy way. And if you go to slide mode now, so I'm going to click up here to slides instead of outline. Boom, and you can see it's it's very kindly created all these little slides. Pretty good. So that's the first thing I wanted to show, is just that you can use outline mode to really quickly make the outline, the bare bones of your presentation. If you have an outline of your presentation, for instance, in Word, or if you've been working on your thesis recently, and you have kind of the um, table of contents, you could even just paste that into outline mode, and it'll immediately make a slide for each of those items in your table of contents, which is pretty cool. All right, so slides mode. Now, the next thing I wanted to show you, uh, the first thing I wanted to show you was outline. The next thing I wanted to show you was design templates. So if you go here, let's see, themes. They keep changing the names of these things. So, you know, PowerPoint has all these little annoying tabs along the top, and it has bugs in these tabs. But I'm going to go to themes. Boom. And what theme should we use for this presentation? So the themes, you probably know about themes, but it basically it just changes the way everything looks and feels. So I click that theme, and look at that. Suddenly, wow. Whoa. Sorry. Now it, now it looks kind of like a presentation. It's kind of coming together. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, or maybe this one. Boom. Ooh, that's a bit sloppy looking. Uh, if you click this little arrow down here, there's more hidden. Boom! Look at all these themes, built-ins. You can go and download them. There's places you can find them. How about this one? This is fun. <gasps> that looks fun. Beach, sun. We need more clouds, but that's pretty good. Um, yeah, all right, so we'll use that. Uh, let's see. So that's a good beginning. So that's the the theme use. So we've used outline to create the basic outline. We've set a theme to make a theme. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show you was how to use the master slide. So if you go up to view, 
and you go to master and you want to view the slide master. Now slide master, basically if you wanted to put something on every slide, like for instance your name, which is a useful thing, or if you wanted to put a slide number, you would put that on the master. So you have to go to view the master. Show me the slide master. And here it is. Slide master is basically kind of the underlying architecture for every single slide. And you could do all kinds of stuff here. You know, you could just put some text if you wanted to. So, you know, if I put my I usually would put a little copyright James and Trilligator or something. You could do that. You could also insert, like, uh, what can you put in here? Eh, we'll put a text box. So we'll start with that. Put a little text box down here and it'll say, Hi, James's presentation. Well, maybe hi isn't good. Let's get rid of that. We'll make it more official. Sorry. Hi. Uh, in fact, I'll make it all official. I'll just put my name. Uh, I'll make it italics. We'll make that white. Do, do, do. Uh, make it smaller, and there we go. Maybe I'll put it in the. Oops, I'll put it in the very bottom corner. So it's in the bottom corner of every slide. A little subliminal thing. Maybe I'll put a give James and Trilligator an A. James and Trilligator gets a star. There we go. Perfect. You could. I don't think I'd recommend doing that, but it's kind of cute. I don't know if my colleagues would like it. But anyway, so there we go. So that will now be on every single slide, um, and. Getting out of Slide Master is one of the nightmares, by the way. It's way over here on the right, way over here. There's a Close Master. Sometimes it's, if you're on this Slide Master thing, it's here, Close Master. But they make it surprisingly hard to do. Anyway, Close Master. So now you'll see that on every slide, I've just put that James truly gets a star. Of course, it's be more useful to just have your name and maybe slide number, things like that. You can insert slide number there. All right, so that's the basics of using Slide Master. The next thing I wanted to show you was transitions. Actually, before I do that, let me just, we'll, we'll put a little bit of art on here just to show you how to go about doing that. Again, you probably know all this stuff. Every year the students are more and more savvy in PowerPoint, but I'll just demonstrate a little bit. So let's say I go over here to Safari and I searched earlier for images. You know, I searched for Bangor University images. Here we go, images. And you could, by the way, just so you know, if you are in image search and you click search tools, there's a lot of useful things that some people don't know about, like you can go here and get, you want only large images, medium icon, you can choose things that are only transparent, like if you're looking for a nice logo-y kind of thing. So there we go, that's where you can get the nice, oh look at that, campus life. Well, we'll take this one, copy, put that up here, put it here, oh there we go. It's not really transparent, but it's good enough. Uh, I'm just gonna put a couple of things just so I have stuff to play with in my transitions and animations. So let's go to the next slide. Where is Bangor? Here we have to have a map. So Bangor University, let's clear all of our filters. And let's see if we can get a map. Map. Is there going to be a map? Oh, there we go. That's a pretty good map. <laughs> Perfect. We'll take this map. Click. Copy image. And I'll paste that here. Where is Bangor? It's not really the most, <laughs> most exciting image. And it's pasted it into a box, which I didn't want to do. Undo, undo, undo. Paste. Ah, it did it again. Oh man. All right, format picture. So in this format picture, you have to crop and you want to anti crop this. PowerPoint, for some reason, does this stupid auto cropping if you paste into placeholders or something. Anyway, I'm not going to spend much more time. That's good enough. We'll make this smaller. Okay, so almost there. The next thing I wanted to show you was just how to use transitions. So if you go to slideshow up here and you choose transitions, you can have all kinds of different transitions. And they're along here along the top. So you can fade, push, wipe, split. And uh, you know maybe we'll do a split here. Split. Whew, ooh, that was cool. And you can also change the options over here to the side. So you can have it go super fast, for instance. I don't like these slow transitions. So I'll make it a super fast one. So now we'll just see what that looks like. If I start the slideshow, so there's the beginning. Spacebar, ooh, look at that, beautiful split. Lovely, eh? Did you guys see the split? I'll go back one, here we go, we'll see, oh! And ah, uh, split, there it is. Now this Bangor University, that should really appear afterwards. We'll have that appear, so I'm gonna click it, go to animations, and I'm gonna have this guy peek in. Whoop! There he is, he peeked in. And I don't wanna wait for the, uh, sorry, so this little bar is very useful, and if you go to, uh, animations, animations, animations. Hey, this guy, where is he? Custom animation. He's under <laughs> reorder. It's really a, another one of these dumb things. So let's say you inserted this animation. Now, if you want to do stuff with it, if you click the reorder, you get this very useful little 
box here, which then lets you change things. So I'm now going to say instead of that Banger logo appearing on a click, I want it to appear after the other thing has come on, and I'll give it have it appear a second later. So now let's just try that. We're almost out of this nuts and bolts section. I just thought it's kind of fun to watch. So ready? Bump and boom! It appeared without me doing anything, as if by magic. All right. So that is how uh, transitions and animations work. Animations I'll come back to later because there's a certain way you can do chart animations. This guy will have zoom in or something as well, dissolve in, something like that. That's kind of cool. And again, you can set whether you want it to be when you click or whether you want it to just be sort of automatic, that kind of stuff. All right, so that was animations. Any questions about outline mode to make quick presentations? using themes to kind of theme them up, using the master to put stuff on each slide. What else did I just talk about? Uh, transitions? Animations? No? All right, well, that should get you ready to put together the basics of a PowerPoint. The next thing I wanted to mention hmm, was two-screen presenting. Raise your hand if you've done two-screen presenting with PowerPoint. Some have, some haven't. The problem I'm going to have, though, is presenting that because I'm set to be mirror mode, and that's kind of the only way I can easily show you. But if my computer, I don't even know if it's worth explaining two screen. You, if, your, if your computer is set to not do mirroring, so you get different pictures on both, and it's like an extended desktop, then if you start PowerPoint, it knows that you have two screens. And on your laptop screen or your local screen, for instance, it'll show you the presenter view, which just will have your notes done up big. Uh, and a little clock showing you where you are in time, and up there will be your slides, and it's pretty useful. Um, if you are interested in that, check it out. The only problem with it is it tends to make people want to kind of read their slides, off, or read the notes off of the slide view. So I'd recommend kind of not using it, but it's up to you. All right, so I'm going to skip the printing explanation. I'll come back to a few more things in animations later, but let me just go back here for a second. I think that I've covered all those things. Have I covered all those things? Uh, outline, so how you can easily, quick and easily use that little thing on the side to make the outline mode. How can you use design templates or themes as they now call them to change the overall look and feel of different slides. You can use master slides for things like page numbers and copyrights. You can use transitions to make them dissolve and split and all that kind of stuff. There's some really cool animation transitions by the way nowadays. I'll just show you, let me just show you one uh, one other one. So if you go to uh, Slideshow, Transitions, they have some cool ones. They have these like bubbly ones. Where are they? Can't even read them anymore. Ooh, Dissolve. Uh, dissolve isn't that interesting. Checkerboard, Blinds. There's some pretty cool ones. If you go here, they have these warps and things. Oh yeah. Glitter. I love glitter. Whoa, that's nice stuff. Uh, tends to be too slow. I'm going to make, see, they have it be a four second transition, which is madness. We'll make it a quick glitter. Uh, and let's see if that's going to work. So now if I go here, get ready, here comes the glitter. Where's banger and transition? Whoa, look at that. That was cool. Anyway, so yeah, there's some cool transitions. You don't want too many transitions. Some of my colleagues find them a bit garish uh, to have those kinds of things. Oh, slideshows being entertaining. Never! Um, anyway, but you feel free, you know, if you want to have something like maybe if it's the results, glimmer, 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 something like that, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, so, where are we now? I think that we've gone through all of those points, two screen presenting. Printing, I'm not going to bother with printing because I don't think any of you are going to print it. And we've done the demo, that means. So, on we go. So, now this is where it starts to get more specific. So once you, now you know how to use PowerPoint to kind of make the presentation, but now the question is what should you put in the presentation? And the answer I always tell people is you want to tell a story, even if it's not, especially if it's not, I would say, the whole story. So you don't want to tell them about every aspect of your research and how there were these 10 competing theories, and so you did a 8 by 4 by 3 by 2 design, and you ended up finding this thing, and there was this interesting four-way interaction, but then there was this three-way... I mean, that's great, and if that is kind of the nub of it, then feel free to tell that story, and good luck, because that's a hard story to tell. And sorry if anyone does have that if I just described your study. Uh, but in general, you should be able to find a kind of cleaner, simpler story. You just want to identify what that story is. You know, we're wondering how it is that when people see uh, color words, what happens in their brain, something like that. You know, whatever, whatever the story might be, you want to try to identify it. It's basically what you would talk about at a party. If someone said, so what are you doing in your dissertation on? You'd say, I'm doing blah, 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 blah. 
And you wouldn't say, well, we're looking at a four-way interaction. There's this discrepancy and the theories and blah, blah, blah. So you want to try to identify sort of the elevator pitch, as they call it. If you're interested, you could do a Google search on elevator pitch, and there's some lovely YouTube videos on people describing how to identify and make a good elevator pitch. They tend to be in business realm. So, you know, I have the greatest idea. It's going to make a million dollars. Here's what you do. you got to have a... Uh, Anyway, so, um, but you should think about what the story is. And before you even start doing your PowerPoint, try to describe what your third year dissertation research was about to a couple of friends. Um, in fact, the best way to come up with the answer, in a sense, the best way to come up with the best story is to just try telling 50 different people, let's say, or 20 different people, what your thesis research was about. And by the end of that, you'll have it down. You'll see where they kind of get a glazed look and, well, I lost that person. So. Uh, as an academic, like if you, I love going into a conference and doing a poster presentation because a poster, you know, you make a poster and you have it there and you stand there for like three hours and people come by and say, oh, what's your poster about? And you say, well, we were looking at blah, blah, And pretty soon after a couple hours of that, you start to really get the story down and you know that they don't want to hear about the blah, blah, blah. You say, you know, it, originally people thought there was this or there was this. It turns out there's an interesting question because which one is it? So we looked at blah, blah, blah. So anyway, if you just tell your dissertation story, five or six times to other people, see what works and try to get a good, compelling story. Remember, it's fine to not tell the whole story. You don't have to give all the conditions of your thesis research. Clarity, simplicity, consistency. You want to have a consistent kind of overall look, tone. That's one reason that it's nice to use those themes that I was showing you with the red and the, the blue in the background of the clouds and stuff. It kind of helps keep at least a visual consistency. Ideally, you'd have also a kind of consistent story, a consistent voice, things like that. All right, now, this is getting more specifically into the details. So, slide advice. Use graphics wherever you can. So, even if it's something stupid like this Sherlock Holmesy thing meant to be kind of the idea of telling a story, if you can put some graphics in there that make the slides more interesting, your audience will appreciate it. They get bored if it's just words the whole time. You could have some blank slides. That's something that I keep intending to do, but I never do. You could have a blank slide where you just say, but what could the answer be? Next slide, something like that. Or you could just have a slide with a big question mark, something to kind of change the look and feel a bit. So you want clarity, you want simplicity, but you also want to have a bit of drama, a bit of interest. And one way to do it is to kind of use graphics. Try to use, where do I say it? Oh, try to use good graphics. Well, let me go on. So fonts, use big fonts. One of the things I hate is slide presentations where I have to strain my eyes. So you should never use any font smaller than 24 point as a rule of thumb. I think. Well, let's see, what is this font size? Right here, right here, right now, this font is 24 point. Do, 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 do. But this one here, he's down to 20. So it's ironic that I kind of broke my own advice right there. I had a feeling I did. It looked a bit small. But believe it or not, that's, you, want them to, you want the text to be about that size. You want it to be very easy to read. And it, one reason to do that is it's nice for the audience, it's easy to see, but it's also going to force you to be more concise. It means you won't be able to have long, rambly, run-on sentences. So force yourself to stick to at least 24 a point. And if you do that and you find your stuff's not fitting, it's not the font's fault. It's your fault. You have to reduce your sentences. All right, so go for that. Uh, include page numbers if you can. The reason in this kind of context is that as the academic and the audience, I want to be able to say, back on slide four, you showed us this graph of blah, 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 blah. It's kind of rude for you as the presenter not to have a slide number down there. Oh, that's not my slide number. Uh, oh, yeah, page eight. There we go. So you could feel free later. Say, back on page eight or slide eight, you should say slide eight, you had said blah, 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 blah. So please do include page numbers, slide numbers, it's really awkward for an academic to have to say on, you know, there was a slide where you had a graph, no, no, not that one, the one before, no, not that one. Anyway, so have slide numbers. Uh, titles on each slide is good. Um, I don't think it's quite as essential, but it's nice to keep things contextualized. I would say that that's a, a nice to have, not a necessary titles on each slide. Use quality or no clip art. Oh yeah, so uh, I was just showing you how to find images on the web, and that's fine. Here is I'll go back over to this other presentation again. You know, there is kind of this insert. You could do clip art, clip art browser if you want a picture of something. Let's say you want to talk about your experiment you did on ducks. No, that's not a duck. Goose. Duck, duck, goose. How do I get that goose in here? Goose, come on out. Oh, look how cute. Well, now I expect at least half of you to have geese. I almost said gooses. Geeses or gooses on your slides. There he is, the banger goose. Uh, we'll put him over here. That's perfect. And maybe, I think, will he let me, can I flip him? Let's see. Do you guys know about reorder? 
You should know about reorder. You can bring things forward or backward. Uh, if you're trying to get a picture behind something, you're going to need to use that. Anyway, you should know about reorder. Also, under rotate, they have a flip. In case you're curious, it's one of the things that's hard to find. But you can flip. Boom! There he is. Now he's coming in. That's much better. Perfect. In fact, I like him so much, I'm going to put him on the Slide Master. Let's see. Let's go back to Slide Master view. Slide Master. Let's put that giant goose everywhere. Oh, now we're talking. This is looking professional. Should we have it? There's the giant goose. Uh, goose coming out from left field. Perfect. So now he'll be on all slides. Uh, you may want to make him a little bit dimmer. So we'll go to format picture, and you can actually change the transparency. Oh, now there's a mysterious ghosty goosey. Ghosty goosey. Perfect. Ghosty goosey, close master, boom. And now on every single slide, we will have our ghosty goosey. There he is. Oh, he looks ominous. Peek. All right, ghosty goosey there. So yeah, that's clip art. You could also just go to the web and find images and insert images. That's always good as well. All right, let's go back. So clip art, uh, clip art, yeah. So limit your text. Use short sentences and bullets wherever you can. So instead of saying participants were asked to press the space bar, you could just say participants press space bar, or you could just say space bar in quotes, something like that. You want to try to get rid of as many words as you can. Go hunting for words and get rid of them. Remember, you're going to be there. It's mostly you presenting stuff. The slides don't need to tell the whole story. The slides are just there as props to let you tell your story. Uh, for references, everyone, every year I get students asking about that. References, some evidence that they're good. This is how I would suggest. Again, it's not official. It's probably, I don't even think there's an APA format for making presentations. But anyway, I'm sure it breaks some rule. But some evidence, I, this is how I would tend to do it. You know, I do a footnote right on the slide because you don't want people to have to wait until the end of your presentation to see the references. What most academics want to do is maybe see the name of the author, if it's a name that they would recognize. They want to maybe see a short title, so like Graphs Rock, da, da, da. And they probably want to see what journal, because we're snobs, most, most academics are. And so we want to see if it's a journal that we recognize. We don't really care what issue or anything like that. At the end of your entire presentation, you may want to have the full references. But on, on the individual slide, it might be worth having just the author, the year, a short title, and the journal article. Uh, the journal name, sorry. Uh, oh, spell check. Uh, every year there's a couple of students who have misspelled words throughout their presentations. Don't let that happen. It's amateur. You should be able to have it. If you want, by the way, one thing you can do. So uh, if I go over here again, remember I have my little outline mode. You can, anytime you want, go to outline mode. Oh, there it is. This entire presentation is here described in outline mode. And what I could do is I could just select all, copy, go put it over in Word and have Word spell check it. So you could try that. I've never tried that myself, but in theory that should work. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go back. Slide advice. Boom. Yeah, so spell check. Uh, you may want to add leading text to the bottom. Hey, let's go. So, and what I mean by that is you may want to have it like, oh, what about graphs? So I do that. I don't know if any of you were in my third year class, but I sometimes will have those things at the bottom. Um, you probably don't need them for this kind of a context. They're sort of nice, I think, as an audience member because it might be that might be the question that you're thinking, and it might just appear. So you could have it sort of appear, uh, let's say, three, four seconds into the slides being on. So in this case, let me just show you as long as we're here. So this what about graphs right now? If I look, he appears on click, but you could actually have it say you want it to appear after previous, and you want it wait sort of two or three seconds, time for the viewers to kind of get into the slide and then suddenly this little thing appears at the bottom. And that's kind of a nice thing that happens automatically. The nice thing about having it after previous as opposed to on click is you don't have to think about it yourself when you're giving the presentation, it's just the drama is there for you. So here's the slide, what is my slide advice? This is too much for that, but if it had been sort of two bullet points and that came on sort of six seconds later, that would be kind of nice. So what about graphs? And for you as the presenter, the reason that that's there is to remind you what your next slide is. Well, so how does this apply to graphs? Let me tell you about that. Graph advice, okay? So in your case, you may want to have, um, you know, but what about ethics, question mark, dot, 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 the slide on, on ethics. Ethics, there were a couple of issues we had to consider. You may want to talk about ethics, by the way. I don't know if you must, but it's no harm in doing it. Uh, it's always nice to have a student third year presentation if there's a brief mention, even if it's just a sentence. In terms of ethical concerns, there were really none. It was a standard computer-based task. 
boom. Right? So you may want to mention ethics. Uh, so graph advice. I'll get back to sort of more specifics for these third year things in a minute. But in terms of graphs, these again are sort of important points. This is what Excel tends to give you as a graph. It's a nightmare in the audience to try to read that. This is what I'd recommend. Remember, your labels, again, at least, I would say maybe at least 20 points here for your labels and graphs. Um, and now it's a question of how you go through graphs. And this is really important, especially for third year presentations. This is kind of the order that you should do it in. It doesn't really matter that much. But basically, let's say that graph comes up, boom. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to say, okay, so here I've graphed on the x-axis. You'll see that I have the face load, how many faces the participant had to remember, whether it was two, four, or six. Two being easy load, six being the heavy load. And this is how well they did as a D prime measure. I'm not going to explain that. But, uh, you know, so D prime is how sensitive they were, how good they were at the task, basically from absolutely rubbish performance to brilliant performance. So what you want to do is basically introduce the x-axis and see what the low and high ends are. Introduce the y-axis and see what the low and high ends are. Then you want to introduce, if you have multiple graphs, you want to say, okay, here I've graphed separately what the results, the participant performance for upright famous faces in solid and upright unfamiliar and novel faces in open. And what I want you to see is that even though the performance was roughly the same across face load, there was a major difference in terms of uh, famous faces being easier. So basically you want to introduce the axes, introduce the lines, and then tell them what they should see. So many times I've seen these presentations where a graph is up there, and they say, and here's the results, and you know, we had some nice data, and then they go on. So be sure to explain the x-axis, explain the y-axis, and tell the audience what they should see. Any questions about that? No. Ooh. I think now is when I was going to show you how to make a graph, was I? Yeah, let me show you quickly how to make a graph. And again, this might be insultingly simple, but I may as well go through it because it's kind of fun. So here is Excel. I'm going to make a new thing. So let's say, we'll zoom in here. Let's say I want to have um, age, and we'll have 17-year-olds, uh, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, and 20-year-olds. And this is... Um, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. I want to come up with something clever, but I can't. So I'm just going to say result. <laughs> and we'll say it's 3.5, 4.8, and 7.2. Oh, and these guys, of course, had to be 12.6. Is that right? I carry the one. I think that's right. All right, so there's a little bit of data. I'll zoom out a bit. Ooh, look how pretty. Now, if you select your data in Excel, and I recommend doing it from scratch. So if you have your thesis and you have your SPSS, whatever it is, just put it in Excel again. Start again from scratch. Go into Excel. Just type in your numbers. Let's say we did want error bars. So I'll put some standard error bars in here. I'll be generous and make them all tiny. 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, and 0 0.7. Oh my god, what the hell did I do? Let's try that again. 0 0.7, 0 0.6, sorry. All right, so now I'm going to graph this. I'm going to select those two. Go up here to chart, and I'll say a column chart, why not? And it's going to be evil, but let's look at it. Ooh, look at that. Age and result. Now, for some reason, it thinks that age... Oh, man, let me try this again. It always does this to me. Chart, what kind of chart do I want? Now, let's just do a line. Oh, in fact, here we'll do a scatter. Ha, ha, ha. Boom. Oh, look at that. That looks pretty good. Results, result, result, nah, it's not great, but it's good enough. So, oh wait, sorry, sorry, let me let me change my mind one more time. I did like the way something happens with columns. So I'm gonna go for columns again. Let's try, ooh, clustered cones. That sounds delicious. Perfect. All right, and we don't really need age because age should be on the bottom. Age, hey, age, gone. Now, for some reason, it, doesn't like this, but that's okay. I'll deal with it later. So there we go. There's a graph, and I'm going to, as I told you before, the fonts here are annoyingly small. So if you go back home and you have the whole graph selected and you make it bigger, 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 and bold, oh, that's getting pretty good. And I will go here and let's see. If I select the whole graph and make it a little bigger, get rid of this word result, oh, that's looking good. We don't want that result. Now, the cool thing, the only reason I'm going through all of this nightmare, I should have age on the bottom, but I'm not going to go through it. It's a pain. Uh, so if I now copy this, copy, boom, I just did a clover C or control C, 
go back to PowerPoint. I'm going to put it in this other presentation of ours with the goose. Let's put this in here. Why go to Banger? Life at Banger. Okay, we'll put it here. Um, oh, here we'll make it. Uh, students love it. Here, and we even have data. That almost fits the story. Okay, here. So now here's our data. And so now if I paste, boom! Oh, there it is. Look how horribly beautiful it is. All right, it's looking pretty good. Uh, it's not great, of course. But if you go to chart, boom, uh, sorry, chart layout, you could change the way it looks. You could change its format. Let's see if any of these things work. Oh, that's getting better. We'll go home. We'll make these fonts bigger, 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 bigger. Oh, that's looking better. Now, the cool thing, this is the only thing I really wanted to show you, was that uh, in PowerPoint, if you pasted a chart from Excel, then it knows how to animate it. And again, I don't know if you want to do it for your thesis or not, but it's kind of cool. So let's say we're going to animate it, and I'm going to use my old favorite, peek in, peek in, boom. So now it peeks in as it should, right? So that's an animation, that's fine. But if you look down here, if it's a chart object you've selected, you can actually change how it does it. So right now it's treating it as one object, but let's do it by series instead. Ooh, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't think, no, by category. Oh, that's better. Let's try that category. So now when I do an animation, it'll say, st and students love it. In fact, here are some data from one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and four-year-olds. Uh, one-year-olds, they thought overall rating of two. Two-year-olds, they gave it a four. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of cool. That it lets you, it knows because it's part of the whole world of Microsoft and the evil empire that is Microsoft, they've integrated the ability to animate these things automatically. It's kind of cool because you can have different categories. So if you had two different groups the, and the control, you could have them up here and stuff like that. Anyway, that's the only thing I wanted to mention about charts. Well, two things. One is that make big axes, big labels, things like that. Uh, and, and two, that you can easily put them in here and have them animate. All right, so back here one more time. Tell them what you should see. Any questions about graphs? Explaining them, remember? Always explain the axes. I, you probably did notice because I did it so obviously, but it's nice also to explain what low and high means. So, you know, this is face load, number of faces that they're asked to remember, whether it's two, four, or six, two being, of course, the easy end of things and six being the hard. Here it's a little bit weirder, right? D prime, who knows what the heck that means, but D prime, high, D prime, this is very good performance effect. Sometimes I will write up here good and here bad, you know, or um, died, lived, something. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. You want to do something to help the audience know what the axes are all about. All right, graph advice. Uh, now, in terms of getting threat, getting ready, walk through Excel and animations. I don't know what that. Oh, oh, that's what I just did. Huh? Graph advice. That was what I just did. Okay, so we already did that. That's how you can use Excel to make charts and how you can make them animate. All right. So now. Presenting before the day, these are a couple of other things you want to do. You want to go word hunting to try and kill off any extra words, boom. So that's just a self-referential example. So if you had typed that, go word hunting to try and kill off any, you don't really need any of those words. You can just say go word hunting. And on the day, you'd say, so you want to go word hunting. In other words, you want to get rid of any extra words that are there. You don't want them. They're not needed, blah, blah, So you're going to say all of that stuff, but you'd want to have the bullet point just be your prompt for what to say. All right. Uh, look for ways to group things together by theme or by topic or by research or by finding. Same thing here. So this is a rewrite of that. Find ways to group it by theme, whether it's by theme, topic. Or... So this second format is much easier for an audience to kind of digest compared to this first format where it's just one long sentence. So see if you can find ways to kind of break things down. You know, So we were interested in the effect of uh, color, time, space, dose, whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, practice your presentation, record it or video it if you can. You'll be amazed at how many times you say um and so and things like that. And it's the only way to ever notice it because they're words and kind of verbal tics that we ignore on our own. So if you record yourself doing it, it's nice. You don't have to be embarrassed in front of friends, but just record yourself and watch yourself. It's incredibly awkwardly painful, uh, but it's a good way to catch things that you do either well or poorly. You might think, oh, that was nice the way I moved my hand that time, or oh, that's pretty good the way I did it. So it's really worth doing if you care about it, and you should. It's like a final exam. You should spend a lot of time on it. Um, Present it to friends, see if it's clear, see if they have questions. Often your friends will have, if they're really paying attention and if they are other third masters or PhD students, they might have the same questions that the academics might give you on the day. And so it's nice to kind of get practiced at answering them as well. Time your presentation. Remember that when you're nervous, you might either speed up, which is the most common thing, or you might slow down. Most people, when they're nervous, do speed up. 
and they talk much faster than they intend. So if you practice it a bunch and time it, you should do better. Uh, memorize, if possible, at least the first slide. So yeah, most people tend to be nervous, most, most nervous for the first 30 seconds, for the first slide or two. So try to at least memorize verbatim your first slide or two. After that, it's a little bit easier. You kind of relax a bit. The room will feel a little more comfortable. And then you can just talk to the slides, which in general is what I recommend. Don't try, definitely don't read your presentation. Don't try to memorize it word for word. Just try to remember kind of what you wanted to say. And if you have enough bullet points and enough images and graphics to let you tell your story and weave your tale, that's far better than trying to memorize it. Uh, so yeah. Then the only thing I was going to mention was memory palaces. Uh, I think I mentioned them in the third year class at one point, maybe not. But anyway, it's an easy way to try to remember, especially, like I say, for the first slide or two. Uh, Raise your if you know about memory palaces. You know roughly how they work. So basically the idea is get a, know a space that you know well. So let's say the house you grew up in, or in my case, the house I currently live in. And there's a path that I always use for my memory palaces. Actually, I, I used one today. I'll show you where I used it. I cheated today. I used a memory palace. <gasps> Cheating. So uh, I knew that on this one, where I was going to, I had to show you PowerPoint, and I wasn't going to have this slide here anymore. So I memorized that slide by using a memory palace. And the way it works is basically, in my mind, I know uh, my house, and I start walking from my son's bedroom. He's at the top of the house, and I sort of walk through his room, down the stairs, past my bedroom, past the bathroom, past my daughter's room. And along that walk, which I can easily do in my head, and all of you, I'm sure, can do not my house, I hope, but your houses, you should be able to do the walk from whatever it is, pick a long walk in your house, and just put objects along that path. So for me, I remember that by my son's bed, there was a police outline on the floor. That was for outline. Uh, and then at the top of the stairs, there was a big temple sitting there at the top of the stairs. That was for templates. Then halfway down the stairs, there was kind of a slave master with whip in hand, kind of kinky dodgy. Uh, and then it looked at the bottom of the stairs in my bedroom, there, the doorway was kind of this weird, glimmery, translucent, transition-y thing. Then in the bathroom, there was Mickey Mouse kind of dancing doo -doo -doo -doo, like an animated thing. And then in my daughter's room, she was working on a big computer with two giant monitors for two screens. Uh, and then for printing in my son's room, there was a giant printer on his bed. Um, and so that's, that's all a memory palace is, is just try to put objects along a path that you know well. And the brain is actually kind of wired up to remember spatial positions of things. So rats are really good at running mazes and stuff. It's kind of one of our deep uh, skills is the ability to remember spatial layout. And so if you put objects, especially kind of emotionally surprising, shocking, etc., objects along a path, it's very easy to remember it. So I've remembered, you know, hour-long speeches this way just by taking a slow walk through my house. There's been a lot of weird things on the stairway. Uh, so yeah, use a memory palace maybe for your, if there's, if you wanted to remember some details about a slide and you want to have it memorized, just put it in a little palace. Uh, where are we? Boom! Memorize if possible. On the day, bum -ba -da -ba, the day comes, you're there, you're going to be a little nervous. Try to dress appropriately. It's not that big of a deal, but we as humans can't help but be influenced by the dress of people. So some, you know, I had this one year where there was, uh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter, but there was one guy who was wearing like a proper suit, another guy was just wearing kind of nice, and one guy was in shorts and a beat up t-shirt. He actually got an A star. He did an incredibly good presentation, but it was hard to not be influenced a little bit by the look. So try to dress appropriately, whatever you think that might be. Uh, do not overly rely on notes. Try not to have any notes if you can help it. You may want to just have a few bullet point notes. It's nice if you don't have them. Speak comfortably and clearly if you can. Try to speak to the person at the back of the room. Uh, that's the best way to go clearly. Laser pointer, laser pointer advice. Bum -ba -da -ba. So this is one of my favorite random bits of advice. My uh, PhD supervisor taught me about this. So usually if you have a laser pointer, you point around, everything's fine. The problem is you get in this horrible feedback loop if you're nervous. So if you're nervous and you point, you'll notice that the laser pointer is moving. You think, oh my god, it's moving. They can tell I'm nervous. And that makes you more nervous. And suddenly the laser pointer starts going crazy. You think, oh my god, now it's getting worse. And it, pretty soon it's like this. And you don't know. And there's no way to stop it. It's just human nerves. It's adrenaline. It's things like that. But as soon as you see it, it throws you off and you start going down this nightmare spiral of Anyway, whatever it is. So there's two solutions. There's a few solutions. There's three solutions, let's say. So one solution is to try to make it look like you're casual and nonchalant. So laser pointer advice in general, you want to use the laser, and you could just kind of indicate roughly. So you'll sometimes see presenters do that. And they're doing it not because they're cool and casual, because they know that it's the way to hide it. So that's an okay way. I think it still is pretty obvious. You could see the second order harmonic motions in my nervousness. 
I'm pretty good now. Uh, I'm still a little nervous. Look at that. Uh, anyway, it's hard to do. Um, the next best way, and I think is the best way, is to hold it against your body. It's a dampener. Uh, and then your body lets you dampen most of the motion. The best, of course, you could use two hands. That's the third way. But I think the best is to do two hands on your body. So laser point advice is blah, blah, blah. You look around, and you can try to use all three. So move it a little bit. So you want to speak comfortably and clearly, but it looks a lot calmer if you have it sort of on your body. It doesn't. It looks a little weird if you start to notice that I'm doing it, but you probably didn't <laughs> notice originally, right? If originally, when I was just kind of talking, you were kind of looking at the laser board, you didn't notice that I had this like on my body. But anyway, that's a, it's worth thinking about. If you want to use laser board, you could also be cool. And I think it's going to be in five and six, and so the, the screen is low enough that you can actually just walk to the screen and touch it. So here's a graph, along here you have this, and that looks kind of cool. It looks pretty confident if you're out there kind of amongst the data. I tend to hide behind a desk. I'm not good at being out here. Out here. <laughs> hey. uh, but yeah, either way is fine. Uh, laser pointer, be aware of that thing. Uh, uses pauses. Pause, if you can. Build drama. Oh my god, it's scary. The drama. The drama. Uh, look around, try to make eye contact with people if you can. If you can't, that's okay. But try to do that kind of stuff. Be enthusiastic, enthusiastic. Yeah. Uh, so psych-specific stuff. Let me move on. So these are. This is actually kind of the meat of some important advice. So first of all, title on your title slide. Let's say, or even if you say it, you may want. Oh look, the laser pointer is on my body, and I'm holding it tight. Isn't that good? It looks so calm. Look at that, dead still. But it looks weird if you look at me now. What the hell? He's holding it like a baby. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So yeah, on the introduction, you want to have the title of your talk, of course, your name. Be sure to put your supervisor's name and your collaborator's names as well. So like if it's, you know, uh, da -da -da, my name is James Schroeder, at the bottom you could say supervised by uh, Patrick Cavanaugh, with thanks to Jody Cullum, Steve Tipper, blah, 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 other names like that. Uh, put them all up there, because otherwise it's, a, it's, it's weird for us to not know who your supervisor was. It just seems strange. It's an, anyway, so just do it. <laughs> uh, Introduction, again, like I said a minute ago, if you can, at your very first slide, as background, don't just start with previous researchers have done da 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 da, da. And you may want to say with, you know, start with something like, um, as people age, there's a whole range of problems that they experience. Some of them are in terms of physical mobility, etc. But of course, one of the big challenges with aging is cognitive decline. That's what we've looked at here. Boom, and then you go into previous researchers have blah, blah, blah. So you want to try to begin with some introduction, even if it's just literally 10 seconds, that explains why anyone in the audience should care about your topic. And it might be tough if you're doing some boring topic, but not, I mean some exciting topic. But anyway, uh, you want to try to make it relevant. You want to try to create some mystery. Have you ever wondered why it is? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so introduction methods, try to use pictures if you can as much as possible. Uh, it's nice if you can have one of these kind of timelines. If you did, this is part of the cognitive centricism, cognitive psychology centric presentation. But if you're doing a computer task, it's nice to have one of these time flow charts where you could say, you know, so the task was people had to see a stream of letters appearing at the center of the screen. It began with a fixation point, and then the letters appeared one after the next. Each one was, it should say, 200 milliseconds or whatever it is. So a stream of letters would come up, and their job was, they had two tasks. The first one was to identify the white letter, and the second task was to say, was there an X or not? So if they watched this stream of things, they would see B, A, B, A, da, da, and at the end they should say it would be B and yes. So that's how you could explain that. Often you'll get people just saying, so they did a standard RSVP task where they report one letter, da, da, da. It's much easier if you can kind of do that. It's even better still if you can actually have a demo. If you, if you did a computer-based task and you can have a demo, if you did a field tasks where you had kids playing with puppets, you got to show the videos. Everyone loves the puppet videos. So every year I get to see some of Mahela's puppet videos. But uh, you know, you want the audience to see what it was like to be a participant in your study. So um, whatever the study is, you want to try to get it across how it worked. Pictures, demos, examples. Skip the details. So many times I've seen, and we then administered, you know, uh, anyway, you don't want all of the details of it. If it's a brain scanning thing, you don't want to go through all the details, nitty gritties of all the kind of ways you treated your data or whatever. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It depends. If it's relevant, then do it. If it's not, then don't. Okay, so if it's a standard procedure, standard way, there's no reason to go through it again. Um, in terms of results, have graphs. These aren't big enough. Walk through them. We've already kind of gone through how to go about walking through them. So here you see, you know, I don't know what the heck this is. GPA, IQ. Is it IQ? No. 
I don't know what it is. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you want to walk people through the graph, like I said before, uh, in terms of the discussion at the end. So you should have, so you'll have the, you know, you'll have the background introduction, maybe some motivation thing, why it's relevant, why anyone should care about it. You know, previous researchers, the methods, here's what you did, and you want one of these kinds of things, or you want to have nice graphics, make it look kind of designerly, like maybe if it's that you went out and uh, observe people eating somewhere. You'll have pictures of people eating. You'll have some kind of schematic of how you went about it. I'll just show you one other little example. It's, it's, not, not, it's, a great, it's not a great example or anything, but uh, I gave a little talk a few days ago for behavior change thing. And I, I don't know why I'm showing this, because it's not a very good example. But it's just an example of another way you could do these kinds of things. So here was the methods that we used for this particular study. You know, It was a four-week thing at the end of each Every two weeks we took a bunch of measures, and again, it's not a fantastic way of showing it, but it's nicer than just having words that say, you know, measures at weeks two, and we use a range of measures. It just kind of visually shows a bit more what people were up to. Um, all right, so that's about methods. So yeah, you want to have method stuff. And then at the end, you do want to have a discussion. So remind them again of why it was important, you know, so again, Cognitive decline is one of the biggest problems facing in society. 30% of people in Wales five years from now will have dementia. Most, blah, 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 whatever it is. Uh, so why was it important? What you found, you know, we, our, does, our results show, blah, blah, blah. What it means, you know, this suggests that it's not actually uh, neural structures that's declining. It's more sensory structures that are feeding into the neural structures. That's what, it, what this means is that we should be trying to identify uh, dementia and cognitive dis decline earlier, specifically, for instance, at spec savers, they should be doing screens because one of the earliest signs of dementia is actually poor vision. Most people don't realize that, blah, blah, blah. The limitations of our study is it was a small sample size. It was just opportunity sample. You should talk about that. And future work, I'm hoping that in the future I'll be able to look at this more specifically in a field study. You know, we're talking to, you could make that up. You could say where you want to go. You know, I'm hoping in my PhD research and my master's research, I'm going to, you know, the next steps in this research would be to do blah, blah. Make it sound like this is your passion and future, and for the next 20 years, you're going to be studying nothing but this dose-dependent cognitive decline or whatever it is. Um, all right, psych-specific stuff. Finally, sorry, it's kind of going on. Arrive early if you can. Get to know the room. Most of you probably know all the rooms really well. Get to know how the AV equipment works. Again, this isn't so relevant for you because you're not going to have to do much, but like, it's still a for those of my class, you know, it's taken me forever to figure out how these stupid lights work. But, uh, oh, I ended up wrong. Is that the right one? Yay, three. Scene three. Scene three. Uh, so, yeah, if you can, try to get there early. Be sure to turn your mobile phone off. Every year someone has a... Some call comes in while they're presenting. Do that. Tell a story, like I said before. Try to make it an intriguing drama. Build drama. Pauses. Talk about next steps. Uh, forget about expectation setting. Uh, forget about this. This is more for business context, confidential PDFs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Don't place plants in the audience. There was one year where this happened to me where, um, so there were, you know, six or let's say eight third year students and one of them presented and at the end of a presentation, before I could ask a question, someone in the audience had a question and it was this really tough statistics question, blah, blah, and the presenter, she had the answer and it was brilliant. She went on and on and she really was. And then later, when it was the other girl's turn to present, this girl had a perfect question and it was clear, it was clear that they had made an agreement with each other to ask a great question so that they could answer a great question and look really smart. So don't do that. Don't, plant, don't put a, I mean, you could try it if you want, but uh, I'd say don't. It's kind of obvious, especially when the one asked the same kind of incredibly articulate, detailed, specific question. Uh, anyway. So yeah, uh, this is not a bad idea to have some extra backup slides. So if you think that someone might ask you about the ANOVA or if there's some interesting interaction there that everyone seems to be interested in, like your supervisor and your friends or the other people, you could have that be a slide after your final slide. And if the academic says, you know, you had this strong interaction, did you look at the individual data? You say, oh, actually here I have a slide for that. And that always looks kind of cool if you have an extra two or three slides afterwards that show, for instance, the raw data, maybe some, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, you could have some additional slides at the end. That's a nice touch if that happens. Uh, handouts, uh, I'm torn on that. There's always one or two people who have handouts. I don't, unless there's a real reason to, I don't see, anyone have thoughts on that? I'm curious, do you guys? 
Sometimes people will give out handouts. In this kind of a context, it's probably not necessary. If it's a, if it's a like a PhD student, if you're doing a presentation for the summer thing, if there is a handout with some interesting de details, or if you have a preprint of a paper, if you want feedback, you know, I'm going to be talking about the research I've been doing. I've handed out a couple of preprints of the paper. If anyone is interested in finding out more, the details are there. Feel free to get in touch with me at any point. You know, if you have a graph of some other stuff, some additional information, you could pass it around the room might be useful. Depending, some of you might be doing research with kids and you may have stimuli that you want to pass around. That's always nice. Puppets or whatever. Puppets. Um, oh yeah, if you get a hard question, feel free to say, I don't know, that's an interesting question. I have no idea. I haven't really thought about that. My guess would be blah, 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 blah. Or no, that's, that's a great idea. We didn't look at that interaction, but we should have. I think I'm going to go do that right after this. Thanks so much for the suggestion. That's fine. Feel free to do that kind of stuff. It's what it's true and it's honest. You know, feel free to be honest with it, with hard questions. Just say you don't know. I don't know. I've never thought about that. In fact, it's a really stupid question. No, don't say that. Uh, um, you could say that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not. The other thing that often will happen is that you'll get an academic who asks you a long, convoluted question, and they might begin with, hey, "Isn't it true that?" And they'll kind of they'll go on for a couple minutes, and at the end, you don't hear an actual question there. So you could say. I think I see where you're going, but I'm not quite sure I understand. So are you, you could say, are you asking done or done? Like if you understood enough to see that there's two different potential questions, you could say, so are you asking whether the interaction was significant? Or are you asking whether we looked at the individual means? Are you asking whether if we did this with monkeys instead of geese, would there be a difference? You could, you know, you could try to get sense of what it is they're asking. Don't just, don't just kind of not answer it and don't just answer kind of a different question. That's always a bit... Uh, awkward. And that often will happen. A student will not understand the question, so they'll answer something very different instead of saying, can you, I, I'm not sure I understood exactly what you're asking. Could you just explain it again? Or is there a graph that I could go to that would help me understand what you're asking? Something like that. Uh, and then end with a clear thank you. That's the other thing. It's always awkward if the talk just kind of pitters out. That kind of, no one knows when to applaud or anything. So in this case, I have another slide. So I'm sure you all do great. Thanks for your attention. But anyway, I'm not going to end with that, actually. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I know. I'm, actually, I am. I'm going to end with that. I'm going to say, that's it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to put the slides on Blackboard. I've already run over a few minutes. I'll put the slides on Blackboard. I'll put the recording of this on Blackboard. First, I guess, are there any questions? If not, I'll be around if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, good luck on the presentations. I'm sure they'll be awesome. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks.